this is the one we'll use. Okay, so are you ready? I am ready. Okay, I'm just gonna do like a snap. <laughs> Sorry. That's no problem. I'm just gonna do a snazzy little intro and then we'll get started. Uh, hello, everyone, dear viewers, and welcome to this very special episode where I talk to industry heavyweight, the man himself, Mr. Chris Avalon. How are you doing? I am doing good, and I am both heavy and full of weight. <laughs> <laughs> Is it Avalon or Avalon? Uh, it's Avalon. Avalon. Right. Because I'm doing a video. It just doesn't to... really matter. <laughs> I, my... My teachers could never quite get it right anyway. It wasn't really important. It's it's important to me because I'm a, this is a very selfish interview. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because I basically reached out to you because I'm doing a video on KOTOR 2 and I had a couple of questions I wanted asked. And I, right. wanted to, I want to get your name right in the video. It's Avalon. Right. Um, so I'm going to give you a slightly longer explanation. Uh, so actually, technically, it's Avalone, but it got Americanized once uh, uh, my family got here to America. So it became Avalone. But if you want to get like super technical about it, it's supposed to be Avalone. <laughs> well, let's just go with Avalone. Let's just go with Avalone. Don't don't overcomplicate things. It's it's fine. <laughs> okay. Uh, and also, I I want to kind of give people an introduction to the sort of things that transpired when we first started talking and uh, right now. So I reached out to you two weeks ago and you said that, yeah, you know, I'm going to be away for a while, but we'll do this eventually. And in those two weeks, the Star Wars Expo happened and a lot of the questions I sent to you became completely obsolete. <laughs> so, uh, I had to send you another questionnaire, but you were very cool about it. Oh, sure. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad you had more questions to ask. <laughs> yeah, that would have been. It would have been so embarrassing if I hadn't. <laughs> if I hadn't had those extra few days to come up with these. But um, I don't want to take too much of your time, so I want to get right into this with the first question. Uh, and this is a question I try to. I, use, I always use this question when I try to inform any video I make, and that is, what was the central goal with Knights of the Old Republic 2? So was there something special you guys wanted to bring to Star Wars, you felt it was lacking, or something like that? Well, I'll skirt over all the pragmatic reasons for uh, how we approached Coder 2, and when it came to the narrative, um, a lot of the thrust for the storyline came from an examination of some interpretations of the Force that were coming out in Episode 1, 2, and 3. Mostly the fact that the Force seemed to have a will of its own, um, and it had a plan for everybody in the universe, but that plan didn't seem to be beneficial for a whole bunch of people would result in a lot of death and destruction and then lastly the idea that we didn't really have any choice over our actions it was a lot of predestination as a role-playing game designer all of those things kind of bothered me mm. so it would be fair to say that if there's a goal it was sort of addressing the philosophical limitations of the franchise yeah, when you have two religions in this universe that are completely giving themselves over to this uh, potentially, an, an, you know, inimical force, it's it raises questions by itself and makes you wonder if there's something beyond that. And I think um, one interesting thing about the the rebels, the rebels TV series, they actually started examining different interpretations of the force, which was really interesting. Really, I only watched yeah. the first two seasons. Yeah. Uh, um, I, it might be the third season where they're, they they start doing. Um, it felt like every season they were trying to give a new perspective on it. It didn't always click a hundred percent, but I thought it was interesting that they were trying it because that felt more true to the universe that other people would be in, t in tune with the Force, but they would have a different cultural perspective and approach to it than say the Jedi or the Sith. Hmm. All right. I need to check that out then. Okay, question two. Uh, I'm gonna skirt over a couple of sort of dot questions just for the sake of time. Uh, could you go over the process of creating some of the characters for this game? Like with Darth Nihilus and Sion, what what is 
Is there a question you're trying to answer with these characters, or are you just taking the sort of pre-established, you know, Sith religion and taking it to an extreme? Or fill fill me in on this. I'm very intrigued. Well, um, in one aspect, Cyan and Nihilus were supposed to be distractions to the main antagonist, uh, Kreia. Um, and in that respect, we needed someone who was more inclined to close quarters physical combat, like Scion was. Uh, and also Scion sort of thematically represented um, Malachor, sign of sort of like crushed together. And then Nihilus was supposed to be the ultimate you know, antagonist, or so it seemed. And and for that, we needed him to be incredibly powerful. Um, and and uh, he would he was he would also serve as a distraction uh, for Kreia. The the that what what happened after that is that a lot of the email questions in my inbox are so like, can Nihilus beat Revan? Can Revan beat Nihilus? <laughs> And I, I give them, I give them answers they hate, and I'm like, it has nothing to do with that, man. <laughs> it's like Revan, Revan is far more clever than Nihilus could ever hope to be. He's more strategic. Uh, it doesn't come down to raw power versus raw power. It's the individuals involved and how they 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 deal with the challenge of the other. Mm. That's another thing I I like about the KOTOR games. Uh, this is about Revan and the Exile. And this is, I don't know if this is really retconned into the second game about Revan, but it seems that the heroes of these games are the people who are able to live in this universe without succumbing to the Force. Like, um, Revan is able to use it to his own, you know, to fill his own goals without becoming a slave to it. and. The exile is able to leave it behind. You know th that's what Kreia thought about her. Is there something to this, or am I looking too hard at it? No, I think you're correct. And also, one thing we tried to do in the second game was make sure we were still respecting Revan as an individual character, and also highlighting some of the non-force skills he brought, he or she brought to the table. Like you know, he had an incredibly powerful strategic mind. Like he wasn't easily deceived. Like he could see other machinations in motion. And that's so that that wasn't like due to the force. It was just that Ra Revan, as a character, was that perceptive to see beyond the moment, which I thought was you know pretty complimentary for for any individual to see, to be more forward thinking and strategic than everyone else who's sort of like succumbing to the chaos all around them. And then that was really important to us. Mm. Right. Because I really like, um, I really like Revan, but I really like him as this sort of mythological figure he's uh, referred to as in the second game. It's a lot like seeing, playing the Metal Gear Solid games with Big Boss and then playing the first one where they're all talking about him. So yeah. interesting, where you get these sort of dispersed... Uh, I, well, well, I'm stumbling over my words. We get all these different views about who he was. Uh, and uh, well, sorry, do you want to say something? No, we, the, our, our goal was to to introduce elements of mystery that suggested something else was going on, and Revan was the one of the first people to pick up on that, and then also build Revan up as, like you're saying, sort of like a very mythic, powerful figure. So it, when you encounter him again, like we've already done the foreshadowing and the build up that the first game was already doing, then added more of it, and then we thought that with a third game, that would just make any interactions with Revan that much more powerful. Mm. And as for all the details of the third game, Chris already talked to me about that off mic. Well, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just quickly going back to Nihilus and Scion, is there anything like um, I, I get that Nihilus, the name, I've heard that it comes from nihilism and an annihilation? Yes. And I got that Scion comes from Scion as an era? But I had I had thought it came from aggression. No, Scion was intended to be like, you know, a spawn of was the suggestion, even though I may have gotten that wrong. The idea was that he the, the name was supposed to suggest that he was an upcoming pupil of Kreia, when in fact he wasn't really that in truth. But it was it was designed to suggest that Nihilus was purposely chosen just because I always viewed Nihilus's power and the Sith teaching, the, the quote-unquote Sith teaching, he had succumbed to 
to be very an, to be a very empty path in Sith teachings because it almost makes you devoid of any passion except hunger and consuming and, and basically annihilation, which is not what the Sith teachings are supposed to be about. Mm. I see. All right, that's really cool. Then I got a couple of questions answered, and the uh, Wikipedia is going to have to be updated. <laughs> Somebody <laughs> needs to get on that. Uh, 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 and uh, just expanding on that with the entire party, I I heard you say somewhere that Atten was your the construction of how to take down a Jedi. Yeah, both both Atten and HK forty seven list all the techniques they'd suggest for killing Jedi, and uh, um, each has their own perspectives. Uh, Atten sort of embraces. Well, if I, you know, if I had to form a <laughs> a group of elite killers to take down Jedi, what were the techniques that I would use to actually to actually wipe them out? And it's interesting because in the Clone Wars TV series, they actually use some of those techniques, which I was really happy to see. Uh, I don't think I was the inspiration for them, but um, it's interesting. No, oh, no, <laughs> they, 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 they had genius writers working on it themselves. I'm sure they, they were all fine. Yeah, actually, it's really funny. I um, I tried to take all those techniques and then write a short story uh, with General Grievous trying to use those some same techniques in the comic series Clone Wars Adventures. But when I submitted the script, uh, Dark Horse Comics was like, this is way too dark for a children's comic <laughs> book. And they're like, we just can't publish this. I'm like, okay, well, that's fair. That's fair. Yeah, that's good. They should have published it, though. Oh, I would have liked it. But they, they, they were correct. It was pretty bloody. Yeah. You are, this is, I haven't written this question down. What do you feel about the prequel movies and that sort of universe that was created around them? Uh, uh, let's see. Uh... Well, again, like I had the problems with the predestination aspects. I thought that they they started digging into too much detail about what makes the Force the Force. I think the the best thing you can do is just stick with Yoda's explanation and Empire Strikes Back, and then just leave it at that. Like, don't don't add too much detail. Don't overcomplicate it. Um, I didn't like the. I thought the second movie was a was was a particular down note. Um, I thought Count Dooku was a waste of time. Uh, <laughs> what else? Uh, I felt like there was a lot of missed opportunities in it because part of me, by the end of the first movie, I was like, man, wouldn't it have been cool if Yoda had said to Qui-Gon, don't train Anakin, or sorry, said to, said to Obi-Wan, don't train Anakin. And then Obi-Wan like thought he knew better than Yoda and then started training Anakin. And then that helped fuel like Anakin's path to the dark side because he, you know, he didn't have a mentor that was, you know, 100% solid in, their own, in, the, in the Jedi teachings. But that's not what happened, so. Oh, mm -hmm. wait, sorry, one, one other thing. So I like General, like, I, I like I like Palpatine a lot. Like, I think as a Sith, I loved his whole approach. I love the machinations. I liked him as, like, the, you know, the, you know, the puppeteer pulling all the strings. And as a bad guy, I really admired uh, the way he sort of, like, slipped in and started, and started undermining the Republic. I thought that, that was pretty cool. So I, I did like Palpatine a lot. Yeah, I really, I think everybody, uh, I think the fans really love him. They're bringing him back for the new movie. Oh, was that confirmed? He was laughing. <laughs> I, I don't know anything well, beyond well, that. I, I got the impression, I looked online, no no one was exactly sure who the hell was laughing. Is what I got. But like, oh. I, I didn't get any confirmation anywhere. If you got confirmation, I'd love to hear it, because I was just confused at the end of that trailer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I imagine, I imagine people are overblowing how much involved he is. I think it's going to be like they visit the Death Star and his lingering spirit is there or something. Uh, it would it would be uh, well I don't know I'm not a writer so m me pitching these things to you is kind of you know unfair but I think that it would be really weird if he showed up again as just the guy right I agree I th I think it's time for the uh, the new trilogy to start introducing more of their own distinctive characters beyond beyond Kylo and and beyond whatever Snoke was because Snoke Snoke totally confused me. I had no idea where he came from. Like I vaguely knew what he wanted, but he just seemed like he was just kind of there. And I thought that was a missed opportunity. Yeah. How did you like in uh, the Last Jedi where all these sort of mystery boxes left over from Episode Seven, like Ray's parents and Snoke's identity, 
that was just sort of closed down immediately. Like, yeah, who are parents? Nobody. Who Snoke? Doesn't matter. He's dead. Yeah, and then and then Snoke, like, and then like Snoke's death surprised me, and I'm like, wow, that was that was pretty trivial. And then I don't know. I I I think I left with more questions at the end of Last Jedi, but then I realized I didn't really care what the answers were to it because so I was like, ah, hey, whatever. Uh, well, you know what you should do, and I don't know how much time you have. Like, I I, I imagine you're a pretty busy guy, but uh. You should make like a five-hour complaint video. <laughs> oh, you just go through it. Have you seen those? <laughs> uh, I'm sure there's a bunch, and I have not seen them. Uh, I just know that my own personal feelings on on the movies, and uh, you know, I I don't, I don't broadcast it too much. But if uh, anyone ever wants to discuss it, I'm happy to discuss it. I see those thumbnails, and I imagine like, yeah, you probably have thought out opinions, but how can you spend five hours just being upset at a movie? I think at that point, uh, you, know, you, you, you get your expectation up. It's a beloved franchise. Um, you are being, you, you're actually given more expectation for episode seven. That, you know, some of these things are going to resolve in, you know, a different dramatic manner. And then they don't. Um, the, the, the backlash from people that really love the franchise, like I, I would almost say like five hours is pretty light. <laughs> oh. That's, that's actually a perspective I didn't see before. But I think also at some point, this becomes a lesson in not being so involved with franchises. Yeah, I think I'd prefer that people take that energy and then go, hey, I wonder if I could do something better than Star Wars that tells a better story. And then, and, and then they go with that and they just go start a franchise of their own and they and they can create an awesome story based on things they see lacking in, in current media. And I think that's always positive. Mm. Yeah, I agree with that. All right, continuing. Aside from Kreia, assumably, who was the most fun character to write? <laughs> um... And this is a this is a weird like this question. This is one of those questions which may not have an answer because this happened fifteen or so years ago. And yeah, you know. but you remember some of them. Like uh, so, I I really enjoyed uh, writing HK forty seven, but that has more to do with uh, with David with the tone that David Gator had already set in the in the first game. But but doing HK's lines were a lot of fun, especially like when he gets his pacifist programming. I had a blast with that. I also liked it when HK started mimicking the characters from the first game and then making fun of them. Um, <laughs> so, so getting, so, so getting a little stuff like that was funny. And then, um, uh, I also enjoyed like, I, you know, writing T3 and four was, was fun because it was sort of an interpretation game for the player where they were trying to, where the player would, would sort of have to translate, what T3 was saying to them through their player responses. And I thought that was, um, that was fun to write, but yeah, the, there was a, you know, I, I actually enjoyed writing all the companions. I just wish I had, had more time to do it. And also I'd sort of downscale the number of companions rather than try and, you know, keep pace with the first game. Yeah. I've seen you, uh, say that, say that a few times that you'd have, re you would have wanted to reduce the allies. Is there any, yeah specific reason is that just in, because of time or no it, it's a it's a question of quality over quantity i i think sometimes and this is a lesson i'd already learned on on previous uh games was you know sometimes you might be driven by the fact that you have to include more than the previous title and that somehow more is better when in fact there's been cases there was cases before that where that's obviously obviously wasn't the case and it proved itself out what people want is they want a quality experience so like if you had had more companions but they were even deeper and had more reactivity that would in my opinion would have gone over much better than okay well now we're just going to dump a you know a huge list of companions that we're going to have to struggle to finish just because we feel like we have to keep up with what bioware did which may not be the best reason to do it, nor would it give you the best quality for the game itself. Mm. Speaking of Bioware, I think it's sort of funny when I was reading about how you guys got the project that Bioware essentially said, no, we want to work on our own projects. And we also don't really like that we have to make this game in an afternoon. It's just a short time scale. <laughs> and then they just dumped it onto you guys. Well, it made great business sense for them. Um, 
So yeah, you're absolutely right. So uh, I think Lucas, I think Lucas Starts had come back to them and said, "Look, uh, you took a long time with the first game, so now you have to turn out the second game even faster." And they're like, "Nope." And then they're also like, "Well, also it's probably time for us to start making, you know, games in our own universes, which is which is." the best thing you, you want to make your own IPs in the game industry. That's, that's sort of the goal for, for developers rather than bolstering up someone else's uh, franchise like star Wars. So, and then Bioware already had a good connection with us from the black Isle slash interplay days. They're like, Hey, I want you, why don't you have obsidian do it? And then they're like, and then, and then they're like, ah, we'll take a, we'll take a cut of the profits too. And I'm like, okay, well, I guess this worked, I guess this worked out for us as a startup, but now we have this really tight schedule and, go yeah and i understand my understanding was that you were you guys were under the impression that you had been given a few more months but then when jim ward took over lucas arts they decided because there wasn't actually a contract signed they decided that wow well, we're not gonna we're not gonna actually give you those three months yeah i mean it's you know it's good business sense to actually work work under a contract and work towards a contract and that was not I, I, our responsibility should have always assumed we'd never have more time and that we should have uh, focused on, well, what's the worst that could happen in terms of the timetable and plan for that? And I know on my end, I I, I was deficient in that regard. I wasn't the, the only one on the team that had that deficiency, but uh, design-wise, uh, it definitely should have planned for the 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 shorter time frame. Mm. And speaking of that, you know, content needing to be cut. How familiar are you with the restoration mods? Uh, I'm pretty familiar with the content they added back. I confess I haven't played through them, even though I'm incredibly happy that they did do the restoration mod. Um, one thing I did want to say is um, I think people are, are, are take the assumption that what gets what got added to the restoration mod was somehow like all of our stuff in the files, when in fact stuff that I've seen is stuff of the restoration uh, developers actually added themselves. So I think that it's a little unfair of people sometimes to simply assume that all that content was generated by Obsidian when in fact it was the restoration modders who actually brought that stuff to life and added their own uh, creativity and content to it. And I'm, I'm incredibly grateful for them for doing it. I just wish we'd had the time to do it. Mm. All right. See, I, if you if you had played through the game, I'd ask you if you could say what, which one is the definitive version to play, but I won't do that then. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because I, uh, I, and not to say that Obsidian did a bad job, that's a wonderful game, but it, it is kind of buggy. Oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. That was a... Uh... That was a trend for quite a while where games would just get finished and they weren't at a level to be released. And it's incredibly unfair to ask any player to shell out money for a game that has bugs like that. I think the situation has gotten worse over time with some developers because they see it as a living product. So they're like, oh, okay, well, it can be released buggy. We'll probably fix it in a week or two or a month or two months. And eventually it'll get to the quality level we were hoping for when in fact the correct approach is you take that time internal to the studio for as long as you need to do it to get those bugs taken care of. And it's, it's just a real shame when um, uh, managers and publishers take the perspective of, yeah, we really like quality sometimes, but if it's inconvenient, if, it, if it's inconvenient for us at the end to have to focus on quality versus delaying the game, like, or, 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 or releasing too soon, then then it, the inconvenience outweighs the quality, and then you watch, you know, X number of years kind of get flushed in a in a tide of you know negative backlash for the bugs that you do get, and yeah, and and no player should have to experience that. Yeah, and that's also an issue there with no no great fan base ever really emerged over a game that was clearly messy. Maybe except for like Kotor two, but if you want to, if you want to have a long running franchise, you need that sort of niche following. You need to launch a proper game. Yep. And also, it's your uh, people. Usually, people who are focused on money uh, forget about the investment in one's reputation and uh, the developer's reputation. 
I, I, I firmly believe that if you spend the passion, time, and effort, and sacrifice when you need to, to relay something that's the best that you can make it, um, and you do that consistently, players pick up on that, and that becomes a far more powerful long-term investment than doing short-term releases where you always kind of fall short of where it was supposed to be, but people are like, well, we can forgive them this time. Oh, and the next time. And this, But I, I think reputation is, is the most important thing, and it actually leads to better returns and a, a stronger feeling of faith among the fan base over time. Mm, definitely. Like, imagine if, um, if FromSoft had, if Activision had released Sekiro without like FromSoft having a good 10 years of good faith with fans. Wouldn't have worked. <laughs> but um, we have to go back to KOTOR. Uh, here's another question. Here's another thing you said in an interview that I want to dive a bit deeper into. You were asked about the process of writing for pre-established worlds. And you said that the challenge there initially is to sort of get in crack what it is that speaks to fans about those worlds and then realize those strengths. Is that fair? Yeah, absolutely. All right. What could you tell me what some of those were for Knights of the Old Republic or, you know, Star Wars? What do you, what well, do you guys thought those were? Well, I, to, to be clear, um, a lot of those were already established by the first game. And what I mean by that is, uh, as far as I heard uh, told to us, is when Bioware got the chance to work on Star Wars and were setting up an RPG for it, they actually got um, everyone in front of a huge whiteboard and they listed out all the things that they thought were core to making a Star Wars experience. Like, hey, Seth versus Jedi, lightsabers, you know, having a R2-D2 type droid be present in the party. Uh, the idea, you know, all, all these all these aspects to it, they they listed out. And a number of those things we, we carried by necessity into the second game. Uh, for me, uh, Star Wars always sort of struck me as sort of like a, um, I guess the, the best explanation is you, you want to deliver the space the space opera experience where it's not too much about the technology or how things work. It's more about the sort of good versus evil conflicts in this universe and heroics versus enemies, enemies that are clearly bad. Um, and that did strike me as being one of the core of the franchises, even though I would argue that Coder 2 sort of does a flanking maneuver around that and has elements of that, but then it also tries to call some of that stuff into question. Mm. All right. Yeah, no, uh, I know Bioware, They when they were asked by somebody who's probably done a more interviews than me and is better at it, they were asked about the sort of central goal of the game. They said that they wanted to evoke classic Star Wars. Yep. While, while keeping everything fresh. Yeah, and I think that was also part of their decision to take have it take place in the Old Republic era because that way they could deliver those pillars of the Star Wars experience but also not have to worry too much about interfering with anything that was sort of going on in the Star Wars quote-unquote modern era. Yeah, they were offered to do a uh, Attack of the Clones, uh, what is this, movie, uh, movie video game. or Really? A yeah, they were they were offered to do a movie adaptation, or you can do your own thing in this far away place. And they chose, oh, we'll do the far away oh, thing. I I did not know that. Yeah, they they made the right choice. And apparently, LucasArts originally intended for it to be, you know, the top down Baldur's Gate sort of camera where it's two D and all that. But Bioware argued that without the visual flair of you know cinematography, blah blah blah. The uh, you couldn't evoke Star Wars properly, which I thought was a really ballsy move when I read it. But I don't yeah, know. That's a good question. I mean, I guess you have to ask if like an isometric top-down view is really um, in keeping with the franchise. Like I would argue that when it comes to things like you know face-to-face -face lightsaber fights, having a more third-person cinematic camera is definitely more in keeping 
uh, with the franchise and I think a top down view, which feels more tactical and strategic to me. And not not that that's a bad thing, but I don't know if that perfectly complements the uh, the franchise outside of space battles. Yeah. And there's also, you know, even then, the combat they included, it was sort of the KOTOR combat. It is sort of better when it is. It, it works like combat you would expect to be abstracted by the top down camera. Yeah, and that that disconnect actually uh, threw me when I was first playing it because I felt like I was trying to engage in combat, but I was being I, I was getting a real time combat presentation, but really it was more of a turn based experience that I was seeing on the screen, and and trying to adjust to that took me a little time when playing the game because it felt kind of off. Mm. I've been doing nothing for the past three months, but playing and making KOTOR videos, playing video games. <laughs> so I'm I'm very in tune with the combat system now, but I just remember going back to that for the first time back in uh, February. I played the first game a couple of years ago, but I went back to it and it was like, wow, this is archaic. Because you, this is the sort of combat, like you don't see this system in a game anymore. Yeah, not not to my knowledge. But then again, I, I my free time has almost evaporated, so my ability to, to play games of, of of the breadth that I should is definitely limited. But yeah, I remember I remember when first playing it, it, it confused me a little bit in terms of how the combat was playing out because it, again, like it felt like a real time experience, what you were seeing on the screen, but I wasn't allowed to act in real time. I was actually slowed down by this sort of turn based system that was actually felt like it was interfering with the experience so yeah it was, it was kind of a i it was a little confusing to me mm -hmm. uh, uh let's see next question oh were there any external inspirations behind kotor 2 um i remember that empire strikes back was a big influence but that's that's in the franchise um Babylon 5 is always a sci-fi series that I go back to because I thought they did a lot of things really, really well in terms of like having factions and civil wars in the factions and and that made the game more dramatically interesting. Also, I also like the idea of how Babylon 5 slowly introduced a looming threat um, that was that was coming for the, you know, for the for the heroes of the show. And I I definitely uh, uh paid homage to that with the uh, the second KOTOR with the implication that there is something much darker and much eviler behind the events that are taking place in the Republic. Mm. Yeah. Uh, similar question I asked you about the characters, but I want to ask you about the planets. Is there something, is there a specific reason for why we visit these planets? Like, is it, are they answers to some philosophical questions or was it just, you know, a gambling planet? That would be cool. Uh, that's a complicated question. So partly it was for pragmatic reasons because we didn't have a lot of art resources for the game. So we, it, it fell upon us to reuse some of the planets from the first game because we had to or else, or else the game wouldn't get finished. Um, uh, so that, that was part of it. The other aspect was there were some planets that Lucas Arts did not want us to use. Well, like, uh, we, we originally suggested, Hey, wouldn't it be cool to go to Alderaan? Um, and they were like, no, we're Alderaan's kind of out. Um, so, and then the planets that were left, uh, we were trying to think of, you know, locations that we had liked in previous games. Um, uh, Malachor Five, obviously the end planet, um, was was important to us. But we all, I, I've always liked Nar Shadda, so like I, I really thought it'd be cool to go there. You know, ever since like Dark Forces, um, and also it seemed like there'd be a lot of opportunity for crime and intrigue in the underbelly of the galaxy if you went there, uh, and, and plus a lot of a lot of opportunities for bounty hunters too. Um, te Telos felt important because. I, we needed some place that seemed like it made sense for the Jedi Order to retreat to. Um, uh, yeah, but but to answer your question, were there any thematic reasons why we chose some of the planets beyond Malachor Five? Not really. Interesting. See, these are these are the questions. It's 
It's and I could have spent hours trying to extrapolate meaning behind. Oh, they're trying to give each faction their own sort of representation and da 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 da. Uh, that would be giving out. That would give, be giving me way too much credit. I assure you. <laughs> All right, that's just saving me work, so I don't really mind. Yeah, I think people. I think uh, uh, players sometimes just get surprised by how many pragmatic developer reasons why certain things are done because it seems like such an artistic endeavor. But really, when you're under the gun, um, you find yourself making a lot of very. Um, practical decisions as to why you're doing things that you may not have done if you had a, a wider budget or more time mm. yeah i uh if you, if you have five minutes i can tell you a story from my own experience with that i'm interested okay so i was working on this game and this is a game i was making in my free time and i haven't finished it and the idea was that i'm seeing a lot of games about childhood but they're all these very warm sort of under the blanket with Coco and your mother game. And that's not how I remember childhood. I want a game about a kid who gets into trouble. And my thinking was, if I make every interaction relate to that idea of getting into trouble, then I will do well in characterization. So I constructed a town, and my thinking was, okay, I, I need to make the character run. How do I relate that back to the, the idea? And I constructed this football field and you know european it's soccer where you're from <laughs> and the idea was okay you you can run into the field and you can steal the ball and i had constructed the uh the players so that they could move and they it, it was janky but they sort of played like they were kind of playing the game but if you ran in and you took the ball then you would be chased and when you were chased you would run even faster than you were running so there was so the, the idea was, the if you want to run really fast, you need to do something to be chased, i.e. get into trouble. Oh, interesting. And eventually, because I had so many assets on screen, I decided, you know, it would be a lot easier if I just put a park there with a sign that says, don't walk on the grass, and if you do, a cop on a Segway will chase you. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you... Did you you end up end up making the game? No, I have it. Uh, I have it saved. Uh, you know, work and school cropped up again, and all of a sudden, yeah. I didn't have time they to usually, save. They usually do. Do you have a title for it? Tom's Troubles was the working name. Oh, okay. I'll uh, I'll I'll send you a copy if I ever finish it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sounds good. Uh, uh, uh. Oh, here's a here's a question. I'm. You know, going back to KOTOR, here's a question I'm interested in. How much freedom did you guys have when making the game? You already sort of alluded to you not being allowed to use Alderaan. Was, um, was, was LucasArts kind of over your shoulders throughout the pro entire process? or Not the entire process. We had a difficult situation where we had to start making the game before the first one came out or before we even knew what the first one was about. So we wasted, I think, like a month or two trying to kick around ideas that we thought would work for a Star Wars game. And then, and then we're completely surprised when the first game came out and it became apparent to us pretty quickly that a lot of the ideas that we had weren't going to work with the expectations set with the first game. And, and there's nothing wrong, nothing wrong with that, but it would have been nice to have known that stuff earlier. Mm. Mm. All right. Because I understand Bioware had a very nice time working with LucasArts. Uh, I don't know. I know that they uh, they definitely took longer than LucasArts wanted, but I think the end result was a firm establishment of a franchise that people really liked and kept going for a while. So. Oh. Okay. Uh, I, on the uh, Wikipedia, again, rocked with errors, as we've <laughs> discussed, <laughs> there's, there's a list compiling a lot of the cut cut content and one in one of those atris is wearing a sith robe and she I, I believe she had a thumbnail uh implying she was originally supposed to be a member of the player's party mm, okay so i i am not sure if she was ever supposed to be a companion i don't think so uh but again it's, it's been it's been a long time uh i'm gonna guess that 
there was most likely a Sith robe for her because of her character arc in the game. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't, I don't think that was ever uh, provided to her. Also, I'm part of me is a little bit glad that it wasn't provided because I, I always liked Atrus in white, and I thought a white garbed Sith was kind of cool. Yeah, I uh, I agree with you. There was also some kind of content which made made it seem like she was going to be take up the name Darth Treya. She was not just kind of following her sort of footsteps. She was going to actually take up the name. Oh, oh yeah, no, absolutely, yeah. So when uh, Kray and Atrus have that conversation in the um, holocron vault, I, the implication is that uh, Kraya is passing on that title to Atrus because. Uh, um, uh, Kraya sort of left it behind. Mm. And about that title, what exactly does it mean? Is it just betrayal or...? Yeah, because um, a lot of the stuff that uh, Atrus did, both with sort of betraying the Jedi, whether whether she intended it or not, or just simply betraying herself, um, uh, that, that encapsulates a lot of the flaws that Atrus has in her character. Um, uh, it, it, you you could point to a number of moments where those could be defined as betrayal, but the fact is, for a good chunk of the game, she refuses to acknowledge the those or take responsibility for those actions until more near the end, where things start becoming more clear. Um, uh, so that that was part of it. Also, on Kraya's aspect, there's a whole bunch of betrayal stuff you can ascribe to her, including you know, betraying both the Jedi and Sith teachings and, you know, um, the, just the sheer amount of deceptions <laughs> she, she, she tosses out over the course of the game. So yeah, that, that was part of the reason behind the, uh, the name. And also I just kind of liked it. Yeah. <laughs> That's also another thing I've noticed about game production. When I read, you know, the backstories of this, a lot of the times it's just, no, I thought it was cool. <laughs> yeah. that. That's a, that's a good impetus for doing some content. And usually, like, if you, you know, if you're the right artist, animator, sound designer, or writer, they can sort of take that cool idea and then work backwards from it and then give it a more solid foundation in the universe. But sometimes it just comes from, wow, wouldn't that be cool if? And then you just work backwards. Mm. All right, all right. Uh, well, this is a question... I asked you before we started recording, but I guess there's no shame in asking it again. And if there's an article written from this conversation, I, I suppose this is going to be it. Uh-oh. Well, well you know, uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> dun, 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 dun. Uh, uh, in this age of reviving old franchises, you know, do you think, first of all, do you think KOTOR 3 will ever happen? And that's a question that's sort of been answered by Kathleen Kennedy. She said that, you know, we're going to do something with that universe someday. But also, and this is the, this is what I want to get to, was like the plans for KOTOR 3, they're going to come out eventually, right? Yeah, and, there, and there's also been many plans for KOTOR 3. There's, you know, uh, LucasArts, there was... Um... Uh, the plot line that we had set up. There was uh, Bioware's pictures for Coder 3. And um, it, a lot of it was just, uh, there was just very low interest, you know, at least the time to do a single player RPG when you possibly could get more players and a higher profit margin by doing something else in that universe, like, you know, whether it's Old Republic or something else. And that, and that was always the challenge. Like, for a lot of publishers, they're like, well, why would we spend X amount of money for a single player experience when we could try for something broader that would generate much more income for us or potentially? And that that's always the argument uh, for, you know, for decisions like that. Mm. I know that Jim Ward, when he took over LucasArts, one of the big things he wanted to do was s- cut the company's uh, dependence on external studios, external uh, developers. Yeah, and also he just really audited LucasArts down. I think he fired like two thirds of the people working there. Yeah, LucasArts went through a lot of um, uh, hirings and firings, and it had a lot of turnover. You know, when when it was uh, when it was kicking, and, we, and it was something a lot of developers in the industry just knew that if you went to LucasArts, like 
they might have they might staff up for a while, but it seemed inevitable that within a short time frame that they would let go of a bunch of other people. So it was never seen as the most secure place to go to work because of that. Mm-hmm. Um, I will I will say one interesting thing is that uh, I actually had a lot of um, hope uh, when when Lucas Arts started reaching out to other developers that had specialized in certain types of games, like when they um, when they reached out to Petroglyph to do the uh, you know the, the the Space Fleet battle games for Star Wars, I thought that was a great idea. When they went to Bioware to make an RPG, I thought that was a great idea because these studios had already proved they knew how to make these tiles style of games, and if you found the right partnerships, that could pay off you know really well for you know both groups involved. Um, but you know, then again, like you know, then well, how, how do we get our own internal development started? Because LucasArts always always had a problem that it felt, uh, especially towards the last years of of trying to get those internal studios up and running, and then turn out a game, um, uh, and that was also a challenge. I remember they had a game called Star Wars thirteen thirteen, which was scrapped. Yep, yep. And that I, uh, I was yeah. so bumped by that. Uh, you know, I, it's all reports like that. It just it wasn't much more beyond what you like people saw in the trailer and the slash slash demo. Like that, that was all they sort of poured themselves into based on you know articles that I've read and you know uh, uh, worth of the industry. Like they 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 put all they had into making that a demo, but in terms of what was beyond that, it was mostly really nebulous after that point. But yeah, it would have been great to have seen that game to come to fruition. But it sounded like they had their own challenges there. Mm-hmm. I uh, I read somewhere, or I heard somewhere, that the idea was that you were going to play this guy for a couple of hours, then he was going to meet Boba Fett, and then he was going to kill Boba Fett and take his armor, and then your character in this game is the Boba Fett we see in the, uh, in the original trilogy. Which I think is more interesting than Boba Fett just being the kid. Get him, Dad! Remember that scene? <laughs> yeah, um... I don't know how I feel about that for because I, I feel like you're basically you're basically saying okay well the Boba Fett you know isn't the real Boba Fett and uh, that that's a very risky thing to do in terms of story. Um, I, I still remember the backlash when uh, when Marvel Comics revealed that you know the Spider Man for the last X years is actually his clone and not the real Spider Man and. Oh. <laughs> yeah, in my opinion, that was that was not a smart decision because all the people that do like that character and have an established history and fiction and understanding of that character, when you yank that rug out from underneath them, you're a, you're really playing with fire there. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I just liked it because I didn't really like that. You know, ah, oh, he's this kid. But uh, yeah, you know. I- yeah. I, it's all for the writer though like because like in clone wars like i did i was i was liking what they were doing with boba fett's introduction throughout that series I'm like oh that's really neat what they're doing here they're actually building him up so i see how this one bounty hunter becomes the person that we see you know in the in the in, second trilogy in clone wars or rebels did you say uh clone wars the animated series oh he's there too oh yeah actually so they did a pretty good job with him oh all right now I need to check out both of these series. They're both in canon, I believe. Uh, I actually I'm not sure anymore, but both of them are definitely worth watching. I uh, I didn't like the pilot for each one of them, and if I didn't have to do research for Jedi Fallen Order, I would not have watched any more beyond that because the two pilots just didn't resonate with me. But once you get past that and keep watching, it's a real both both of them are really good series. Hmm. You know what's a good series that uh, that Samurai Jack. Star Wars yeah, show. Yes. Oh yeah, that was oh that was fantastic. Yeah, we were, sorry, not not to go on a cutter three round, but the uh, <laughs> the the lightsaber battles they had in that really short series between Ventress and Anakin, and also uh, Mace Windu's abilities of the Force. Like I transcribed every single power and maneuver from there, and I'm like, this is what we should have the fights in Coder three be like because this is taking the Force powers and lightsaber duels to a whole another level. I was loving it. Uh, that's an, that's another instance of that would be really cool and that's why it's made right <laughs> maybe i think that they just they they were a little bit more inventive with how they saw telekinesis because like that entire sequence where i think ventress first first fights anakin 
I, I thought they just went crazy nuts with it, which I loved. I, I, but she was using her force powers and what felt like new ways. Uh, you know, she was taking out all the supporting troops and then like, you know, but then the, the fights they had across the temple were just really, really good. I was just like, wow, this is really well choreographed. This is good. Mm-hmm. I also remember Mace Windu beating a bunch of those robots. That was cool. Yeah, he definitely became a very scary force in that series. And also I thought the stuff that um, whenever I was using the force and then seeing it also translate into environment and weather effects, like, you know, hey, I'm on Tatooine and I, or, or whatever the sand planet was, and he does, you know, a force blast and then it actually affects the, uh, you know, the sand and the terrain around him. And I'm like, that's pretty darn cool right there. That just makes it even more powerful. Yeah. And uh, this is my final sort of Kotor question. If there's something you'd want people to take away from it, what would it be? And that's a, that's a question with many interpretations, but I'm going to let you feel your way through it. Yeah, I guess the one I'd encourage people to take away from is that um, it's okay to question the franchise. Um, you don't have to answer those questions for the player, nor, nor, do you, nor should you. You can get people's perspectives in that world and why they question certain things. But asking questions of a franchise, if they lead somewhere interesting, I feel that's always worthwhile. Mm. All right. And here are some questions, my, you know, non-cultural questions my friends and viewers wanted to throw your way. And I think these are more fun questions. Uh, well, we'll see. <laughs> is there anything, this is from my friend Daniel, is there something you think Fallout lost in the transition from Interplay to Bethesda? And is there something you think it gained? Well, Daniel, <laughs> first <laughs> off, um, well, no, cause that's kind of tough because uh, at Fallout's last days in Interplay uh, didn't really have a, uh, the, the games that they were turning out weren't as well received as the, like the more core, like, you know, for the Fallout 1 you know, reveal was came came on pretty strong to RPG players. In fact, even stronger than their play ever meant. So, what what do I think uh, got lost? Well, I think um, there's been a decline in the amount of branching mechanics you can do. Um, mm-hmm. I think initially there was a transition challenge into how you do certain RPG narrative techniques in the new the new version of the, the fallout universe um i think bethesda did the open world part of the fallout experience uh, way better than it had been done previously but i think they were still playing um some degree of catch-up when it came to faction mechanics and uh and they got better with this in fallout 4 with um uh creating more companions that had a lot more uh depth to them versus say um you know hey bad karma guy neutral karma guy and good karma guy and that's sort of who they are they don't really have a ton to say beyond that but then i think in fallout 4 they made a stronger push to include more specific character arcs and involve more of the factions but um uh it's always challenging because i think there's always a danger in trying to make a single player story for an open world experience. I don't think the two really mesh that well together. Um, you have to construct the story so it's a bit more free form and it's sort of equally open world like the environment is. And I think that's a delicate balance to strike. Here's my sort of pile on, on that question. Um, do you ever... Do you ever get tired of people asking you about Fallout? <laughs> no, I mean, I, I, the um, no, uh, the. Do I get tired about anything about it? Not, not really. I mean, I'm always happy to answer questions about it. I, I really like uh, working in that universe. Uh, it was a, it was a real breath of fresh air after doing a bunch of fantasy games to work on a game where you could actually write more more modern sounding dialogue and have a lot more fun with it. And the idea that sort of like the uh, the element of dark humor that Tim Kaine put in Fallout One that you could play around with that was was also it didn't take itself super seriously. Um, it always had a really nice aesthetic to it. Like I, I always like talking about it and giving thoughts about Fallout, uh, but I also recognize that you know the the canon is transferred over. Um, to Bethesda, so getting getting too attached to the quote unquote, I guess, expanded universe of the previous games may not, you know, may not continue to translate with the with the new games. I, I will say, 
I I loved working on uh, Interplay's Fallout Three, the uh, the Van Buren project, and I put a lot of heart and soul into it. But even though that got canceled, the opportunity to take a chunk of those ideas and put them back into Fallout New Vegas was kind of proof that everything like sort of comes back around. Yeah. So that was that was encouraging. That must have been really fun to hear then, since you had that love for that franchise to get like, oh hey, we're doing Fallout. Yeah, it was. We we're like, what? Then like, yeah, because like you know, sometimes like you'll hear about projects in the works, and you probably won't get super excited about them. But Fallout was not the case. Like everyone was pretty jazzed about that. Yeah, awesome. It was awesome. Uh, uh, let's see. Oh, this is a question I had. Uh, you know, and uh, before I get to it, I want to talk a bit more about Fallout, if you don't mind. <laughs> when I when I started looking at KOTOR 2, or uh, researching it, I saw, ah, Chris Avalon. Now I'm going to admit, I, I know Fallout mostly through Osmosis. Played a bit of... <laughs> new- <laughs> I've played a bit of New Vegas, and I'm doing my first playthrough of the first Fallout, and I'm enjoying it. But my, I, I saw your name on um, KOTOR 2, and I was like, oh, yeah, that's the guy who made, who made Fallout. He, made, he's, he created the Fallout game. <laughs> Absolutely not true. <laughs> yeah, and I was yeah, very yeah. happy. I was very happy that I did some research before doing this. Yes. Yeah, the original uh, project leads were uh, uh, Tim Kane, Leonard Bayarski, uh, Jason Anderson, and also the lead designer, Chris Taylor. And um, I think Jason Anderson's at NXile now. Leonard and Tim Kane are at Obsidian. And I'm not 100% sure where Chris Taylor is right now. But yeah, those, those, those individuals are the ones to thank. And um, there, was a long, there was a long process to get to Fallout, strangely enough. So... Uh, yeah, even I don't think even they intended to even make a fallout when they started. It just ended up that way. Yeah, I've heard the story that it began with one of them just leaving a note, giving everyone a message like, "Hey, there's gonna be pizza in the cafeteria after work if anyone wants to show up." And then they sort of spun it from there. I don't know if that's true though. Uh, I don't either. I thought it. Uh, I thought it started with, "Oh, we can't do Wasteland because Electronic Arts owns that." So let's do another post-apocalyptic game. Why don't we use the GURPS license to do it, um, which is a pen and paper system from Steve Jackson Games. And then the GURPS license fell through. And then they're like, well, I guess we have to make a brand new rule system for this new game called Fallout, but it won't be a GURPS game. And then suddenly it ended up being you know, one of the biggest post-apocalyptic games to ever come out. So it was always proof that even if you can't work in the franchise you want or the or the game license you want, maybe you can make something better that has an even more lasting impact. And that was the lesson. Well, that was that was one of the many lessons that Fallout taught to me. Yeah, that's awesome. That's the last thing I'm going to ask you about Fallout today. I had thought about I had thought about accosting you with an idea for a Fallout game, <laughs> but that would that would have more have been just to annoy my friends who are massive fans of this franchise. <laughs> but I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Uh, from interviews you've given about KOTOR and Planescape Torment, Planescape Torment, another great game. I played the first like eight hours of that, and I'm going to get back to that. But you mentioned how the, working on those projects gave you opportunities to address things you disliked about them, like the condi- traditional fantasy tropes and the deterministic nature of the Force. Um, are we going to see that design philosophy on display in System Shock when we finally have it? Uh, no, and I'll tell you why. Uh, so first off... Because you don't uh, dislike anything uh, in System Shock. So, like, well, I mean, it wouldn't be an overriding thing. So, for example, for the System Shock 1 project, um, a lot of the goal there is to keep it you know, in tradition with the system shock that came out. So ideally, like, you don't want to... It it would be disrespectful to that franchise to suddenly put a whole new huge layer of interpretation on it and new narrative elements without respecting where, where, you know, it it came from. With System Shock 3, um, uh, a lot of the original story is sort of established. And now, um, and I... 
don't think that raising some of those questions about you know uh you know a dislike for the universe that that didn't really come out to me so much when playing system shock because i didn't really have any problems with the universe per se like i love system shock 2 i love the first one i like what i was seeing for system i like what i'm seeing for system shock 3 um yeah i don't know so you probably would not see that in system shock but you might see other interpretations in other franchises and other games when they come out all right awesome uh, I'm just like gonna be real with you here. I I just included that question because I wanted to talk to you about System Shock. <laughs> Are you? I knew you were working on the remake. Are you working on System Shock Three too? Oh uh, yeah, the, yeah. We I um, Warren Spector dropped me a line one day and asked if I uh, uh, if, if I'd be willing to sort of like be a sounding board for some of the story ideas they were kicking around and. Uh, uh, after I let my fanboy cool down quietly, uh, I said, sure, I'd love to do that. Uh, I, I'm not like uh, full time involved with it, but uh, me and Warren do touch base occasionally about certain story elements and, uh, you know, providing feedback and kicking ideas around back and forth. But mostly that's all on other side and Warren's end. And again, like I'm mostly just a sounding board for that stuff. But the chance to even work with Warren Spector, I never thought I'd get the opportunity. So I sort of leapt at the chance. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, I don't know if you got to play it, but, um, no, wait a minute, you worked on Prey, didn't you? I did. Yeah. <laughs> Whoa, that was almost awkward. Uh, uh, yeah, that game is the closest I think we've gotten to that old System Shock feel in a while. Even though I think yeah. it's, I think it's, System Shock is very stripped down, but, um, I still liked Prey. I wish I'd played it on a PC. Yeah, Prey had a lot of echoes for the uh, the first system of shock, even down the, to the names for some of the levels. I'm like, hey, I'm back in the shuttle bay. Oh, I know what this is. And like, yeah. So the um, so the, and, that, and that was part of the conscious design when the when when Prey was uh, was being built. So uh, that was another reason that I wanted to be part of that. And it was very it was very nice of them to invite me. That's awesome. I also like the framing device where you're sort of asking players how to behave and then. When they don't really behave that way when you make them do it. It's such a cool game. Yeah, it does. I really like the intro for that game. It really, it really messes with your head. Yeah. And it's framed as just this sort of silly scene while this stuff is going on. <laughs> uh, uh, oh, uh, is there anything, is there any genre of game you haven't worked on yet, but you really want to? Because you're, you're versatile. Yeah, um, I'd like to do more work on maybe real-time strategy games just so I can get um, a feel for how to weave narrative into those types of structures. But to be honest, like I've been able to work with people I've always wanted to work with. Whether you know, it's like Warren Spector or, or Ken Levine and um, and writers I've wanted to work with. Uh, and I mean, I got to work on, you know, I got the chance to work on Bloodlines 2, which I never thought was a possibility, and that became a reality. Um, working on Divinity Original Sin 2 was awesome. Uh, uh, Prey, I, I didn't realize what that they, that, that um, Arcane was doing that project, but when they introduced me to it, that was great. Uh, yeah, so mostly it's been, uh, I've had the opportunity to work with a bunch of franchises and developers that I've wanted to work with, and uh, overall it's been a really great experience. Awesome. Do you know what game Ken Levine is making? Because I see, like, every year is a little bit of a drip. Mum's the word. Curses. I, I can say nothing. <laughs> I'm really excited for that, though. You should you know, be. I'll just, I'll reach out to him then, ask him <laughs> questions. You guys all hang out, yeah? Uh, well, he's in Boston, so... Uh, it's kind of a commute, but uh, occasionally, yes. All right. That's cool. That's cool. Uh, uh, oh, uh, Star Wars again. What was the experience of writing for Fallen Order like? Uh, it was pretty cool. Like, I didn't realize that uh, Respawn was doing a Star Wars game. And then uh, one of their production staff, uh, Don Roy, who, um, who I'd known previously, he asked if uh, I would be interested in stopping by the studio for you know some project they were working on I'm like oh yeah sure i love to check it out um because respawn had a pretty great track record with games they'd released 
uh, so far. So I'm like, oh, well, this seems like a pretty solid studio, and they turn out uh, good games. So I got there, and then I realized it was Star Wars, and I realized what they were doing with Star Wars. And I got really excited because uh, it'd been a while, and um, also uh, their project director uh, was uh, Stig, who worked on uh, God of War for Sony, God of War Three for Sony, and then. Um, there was a colleague that I knew but never had actually worked directly with, and his name was Aaron Contreras, and he was the narrative lead on Mafia 3. And the chance to work with both of those folks uh, was, uh, I was like, yep, sign me up. I'm completely interested. And then uh, we set about uh, fleshing out the rest of the game. Awesome. And you got to watch a lot of cartoons, I've gathered, from this <laughs> conversation. I, I did have to brush up on my research. <laughs> And uh, this is the final question. This has been like an hour. This is breezy. This is good. Are there, <laughs> <laughs> are there any books you would recommend to aspiring designers? To aspire, to, uh, to aspiring writers, designers, just in general? Yeah, there's a few of them. Um, so it's the, the Art of Game Design by Jesse Schnell is one of them. Um, that, that is a pretty comprehensive look on game design. Uh, it's definitely worth reading. Um, Ralph Coster's books, uh, just about any of them, are good to pick up and uh, examine uh, just from a game design standpoint. Uh, for narrative designers, there is a book called Hamlet's Hit Points, which examines the narrative structure for uh, three three particular media uh, sources. One's like uh, Dr. No, one's uh, Hamlet, and then one's, um, oh my God, I can't remember the third one, damn it. Uh, but, but it's an interesting take on how the traditional narrative structure actually may not apply on some of these pop, more, more popular widespread works. So that, that, that's a really good examination, I think, for any narrative designer. Um, lastly, um, a big a big job of developers is uh, being able to pitch an idea or pitch a project to either other developers or a publisher. And there's a book by Blake Snyder called Save the Cat, which explains how that's done in the movie industry and gives some really good tips on how you structure a pitch and how you can make an idea for movies compelling. But I think a lot of the stuff in that book actually applies to, can, can easily apply to games as well. Like giving characters lock lines and all that. Well, that and like um, j just talking to a game player and then giving them the one sentence of like, would you be interested in this? And then you say the one sentence, and then you see where the reaction falls flat or where or where people get excited. Oh. Right. I'll put pictures of all of those books on screen so people can go buy them. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't have anything more to say. You have something you want to talk about? I'm, kind of a, I'm sort of accosting you with that at the end of no, the video. No, you're, you're not accosting me at all. You're actually you're, you're, you're asking very politely, and I appreciate it, except for that guy, Daniel. The guy, <laughs> Daniel. <laughs> I started to ask fallout questions on Star Wars. My apologies, My apologies Daniel. Uh, you know, I have nothing to hype or talk about. Uh, I just wanted to be here and answer whatever questions you have. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for this. I'll probably, now that I have your Skype and your email, I'll probably annoy you someday later. That would be accosting you. But uh, so, yeah, thanks very much for doing this. Hey, it was a lot of fun. Thanks, uh, thanks for the questions, and uh, all of them were really great, except that one from Daniel. <laughs> I'll let him know. <laughs> uh, he'll be happy to know. I'm really happy you say this because I kind of like, I like playfully b being a dick to him of all of my <laughs> friends. <laughs> I'm very happy you can share in that with me. Uh, but uh, but again, thanks so much for doing this, and um, I hope everybody who's listening to this follows you on Twitter, and I hope they all play your games and that they get a lot of success. Uh, they they don't have to do that as long as they. They look. They learn from games that I'm working on about all the things not to do and make better games. That's all I care about. <laughs> all right. I'll uh, like I said. I'll annoy you some day later. I'm trying to close this down. We're, I'm very bad at it. All right. Until next time, then. Uh, okay. <laughs> until next time. Thank you so much. Sure.